Well, hello and welcome to another one of the little podcasts of the occasional podcasting duo here, Phil and Hugh. Uh, Phil, down in, in London there at Route 6, and I'm sure he'll put up the relevant captions, and Hugh Waters over here in Gloucestershire doing whatever it is I get up to uh, during the daylight hours. Um, and Phil was feeling his age um, recently, and this year... 2012 is an interesting one because it's exactly 50 years since 1962. A very busy year was 1962. The new pedestrian crossings, as I'm sure not very many of you will remember, were causing chaos in uh, in Waterloo. Uh, the new panda crossings came into uh, into use. Um, we also discovered, uh, which I didn't know, that the Americans had landed a, a rocket on the moon, but the telly pictures didn't come back. A bit like my picture today, not coming to you. <laughs> um, and and in fact. Glenn, um, uh, John Glenn, the astronaut, managed to circumnavigate the Earth three times in his capsule, which I do remember, uh, although I was very small, I was only what, five, I suppose. Uh, I do remember the, the hoo-ha about it. However, that's not all that was going on in 1962, 50 years ago. Phil, you came up with something which you were fiddling with earlier in the day. Well, there's something I've, I fiddled with most days. It was that it was it's 50 years since the Beatles released Love Me Do, their first record. Um, and 50 years since the first Bond film, which I can't remember what it was. Uh, would it be Dr. No, perhaps? But anyway, it, yes, it, it seems like a lot of things went on in 1962. Um, but the thing um, that uh, is still relevant to us um, and the kind of stuff we do, and I think it's probably the only protocol from the time that's still widely used, is RS-232. Good old RS-232. Oh, right. Good old RS-232. Um, uh, which was as a standard was was initially proposed in sixty two although um the version that we kind of came to know and love and everybody uses i may say everybody uses it's still used quite a lot today is r s two three two c um that you know the third revision and um uh you know that was published in nineteen sixty seven the same year that yours truly uh, was was published i suppose <laughs> made, oh, really? made his entrance into the world <laughs> published what a lovely way of saying yes um and and um it's uh because obviously um, the, the last podcast we did was all about um, uh, brewing custom hardware and, and those kind of things and we're, we're starting to touch on on um, you know custom boards that you can use for, for building um, uh, boxes to do things and our next podcast which we promised you know would be the next one um, uh, you know is about the Raspberry Pi and, and the Netium uh, network control boards um, but I haven't had a chance because we've been so busy you haven't had a chance to get to grips with my Raspberry Pi it's sitting there in its styrofoam packaging waiting for me to spend some time with it just haven't had a chance Um but what I have done a few times over the last month is to go to facilities at, and, and had to reconfigure pieces of equipment using RS-232C, using that, that old school serial interface between my laptop and a piece of equipment. Uh, you know, typically my laptop and a network switch or my laptop and um, a KVM over IP uh, sender receiver system. Uh, and still still very much used and and still pertinent to the the track we're following because the netium boards that we'll be dealing with in the next podcast you can figure them over rs232c uh, that's that's how you talk to them and it's a, it's a venerable old standard as a, as we said you know has its roots 50 years ago and and can you think of any other uh, protocol that's still in use um uh, today that, that that had its sort of birth you know so long ago i i, I don't think so um, I've got up the uh, the EIA um, uh, RS-232 standard um, um, uh, web page. Uh, I used to have a, um, when was, when, from when I was at the BBC, um, I, I used to have the actual uh, document, which, um, you know, looked like something from the 1960s. Um, and I think it was a DARPA um, uh, published version of the standard. Um, and the thing that puts RS-232 into perspective that kind of gives us all um, a real understanding of, of why it is the way it is, is if you think about what it was originally used for. And the only thing it was originally used for was to connect um, green screen terminals, uh, or in fact teletype printers, to, to modems. That was the only thing it was ever intended for. Um, it, it has no further application other than that if you read the standard. It was never intended as a standard for connecting to um, uh, you know, network uh, uh, switches or network um, uh, routers. I mean, you know, they were barely even thought of back in the early 60s. Um, uh, and, and, and with that in mind, uh, if you then look at the, uh, the pinout of an RS-232 connector, um, it becomes quite clear um, that, that, that we're in the business here of modems, of phone lines, 
of, of, of low speed data um, across public telephone networks. And remember, this is this this predates the internet. This is this is when everything was point to point. This is before packet switch networks. This is this is real kind of old school. Um, you know, you yeah. you, you, know, you imagine kind of uh, you know being developed. You know, with very much kind of military applications in mind and that kind of thing. And I've got up a um, the pinout of a twenty five pin D RS two three two C connector. And and again, the twenty five pin D type connector was the only connector that was defined. Uh, back in the late 60s none of this nonsense of a 9 pin d type or an rj45 as you find on some pieces of equipment um it was mere it, it was it was a 25 pin d connector uh, and and on the back of your terminal be that a, a mechanical teletype terminal or a, a vdu style terminal a vt100 terminal it was um it was a, a it was a male connector and on the back of your modem it was a uh, a female connector, and I'm, I'm, I've just found a um, a website that's uh, all about uh, VT100 terminals. I've got got one up on screen. They they were they were very common uh, when I worked at the BBC. We had we had the basis newsroom computer system that was a bunch of uh, PDP11 microcomputers networked together with 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 VT100 terminals hanging off them, and they again all connected over 232 back to the mainframe. But um, just going back to that pinout, and we uh, kind of read through all the all, all the all the signal lines that are there. But a lot of them look very much like they're to do with telephone lines. There's a ring indicator on pin 22. There's a uh, you know various data carrier ready, data carrier detect type pins, um, and uh, uh, you know things that, that that serve to tell the sending device that yes, this modem has got a telephone line. We've got we've got ring indicator. We've got dial tone, uh, and and we're ready to take a phone number now, please. And um, and so. Although we only really use um, RS two three two C, you know, for sort of machine to machine communication, the the the, the way it was intended was, uh, you, you know, machine to uh, modem, and then modem through telephone line, and then um, uh, modem to mainframe computer. That that was the intention. You know, if only we'd have had something as reliable as RS two three two for 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 Hughes webcam, we'd we'd be in business. Well, yeah. <laughs> but we're nearly back. So I've got up on screen now um just a, a little illustration of that terminal to modem to phone line to modem back to mainframe. And RS two three two C um has this set of ideas called something's a DTE. Look at that, your camera's even spinning around. <laughs> so some, so, something, something's uh, a DT, a data terminal equipment, or something is a DCE, a data communicating equipment. I never really understood that. So just go into that a bit more. So uh, this is historical value. We're presumably not using these lines at all anymore. So oh no no no, no 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 these, these these are still very much very much sort of pertinent. We get, and we'll get onto why we need null modem adapters and, and cables and such in a moment. But a DTE is a, a data terminal equipment, and that back in the day would have been a mechanical teletype or a, you know green screen VDU. Nowadays it's a PC. Um, and then we've got DCEs, data communicating equipment, which is a modem. And oh, right. and, and and so when and, and so, so so the little thing I've got up at the moment shows that that that, that sort of path of DTE RS two three two to a DCE phone line to another DCE and then RS two three two to a DTE. So that's how you connect your your terminal to your mainframe computer down a leased phone line, you know, or a dial up phone line. Um, that was mm-hmm. that, that was that was the way people did things back then. But if you consider that, that, that now, to, to use RS-232 you know, as it's used nowadays, um, actually, we just want to go DTE to DTE. We, we, do, we don't want all that kind of two modems and a phone line in the way. We just want to go DTE to DTE and use it for that kind of style of communication. And, and so having said that a DTE, a data terminal equipment, always has a, a, a if they follow the standard, has a, has a male connector on the back of it, and a DCE always has a female connector, uh, an RS-232 cable, which was female to female, um, is is what's often called a null modem cable. Or well, you can get a null modem adapter as well to achieve ah, this for you. And, and so the term null modem means we're not using one. We're not using a modem. No modem required. So we're using a null modem cable. And so so that's all it means. Yeah. Null modem. So if you if you want to if you want to use <laughs> like slow so, slow traffic between two PCs using a terminal program. Um, because remember RS two three two, it's an unbalanced standard. It only goes up to um, it only goes up to about one hundred fifteen kilobits per second, even in the most modern implementations. Um, you'd need that, that 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 null modem cable. And what does a null modem cable do? Well, null modem cable essentially all it does is it crosses over the TX and the RX line. 
So, so the TX line where data is sent from the PC, which on the modem, because the modem's got the female connector, knows about the crossover. Um, if, you go, if you're going DTE to DTE, then you need a crossover cable. You need to cross over the TX to the RX, the RX to the TX, and in theory, you should be good. Well, it's, it's a bit more involved than that, but but that's kind of the, the, the bare bones of it. And and so up on the screen here, I've got the two pinouts for a DTE, the data terminal equipment, the, the back of your PC, or a, a, a green screen LED, a VDU, or a, or a mechanical teletype. And DCE, the... Um, uh, let's try and make that a bit bigger, so it's a bit more, a bit clearer. And the, and the modem. Um, but as mentioned, there's an awful lot of stuff in there. There's 25 blinking signal lines on there. And, and you know, as you, as you well know, um, uh, modern PCs, if they have an RS-232 port at all, which increasingly they don't, um, you, they yeah. do it on a 9-pin connector. It's still a 9-pin male connector, so they follow the standard to, to that degree. And lots of equipment have even abandoned D-type connectors for RS-232, and they use um, typically an RJ-11 or RJ-12. So if you're configuring a Hewlett-Packard switch over serial, it's a it's an RJ11 connector, a little kind of phone jack type connector, or or some switches. So I think um, um, if I'm right in thinking this, the uh, Force 10 switches, sort of um, you know, sort of data center type standard switches, they use an RJ45. It looks like a network connector, but it's really uh, uh, an RJ uh, an RS232C connector. And, oh, is it? I hadn't realized. And that. in fact, they, they ship a little breakout dongle, you know, RJ45 to D type, um, and so. The first question you ask yourself, if I've got to hook up my computer to a, a piece of equipment that, that I'm going to talk to over RS-232, firstly is, am I talking to a DTE or a DCE? So right. so some things like network switches, some of them are D, behave like DCEs, some behave like DTEs, and that governs your choice of what kind of cable I need. Do I need a crossover cable or do I need a straight pin-to-pin -pin cable? If it's a pin-to-pin -pin cable, it'll be a male-to-female female to the back of my PC, male to the yeah. back of to, to the piece of equipment because that'll have a female connector on it. But if I've got two pieces of equipment with the same sex of connector on, two males, then it's a female-female cable and it's a null modem cable. It has to be a crossover cable. Um, uh, and, and so with a properly wide cross cable, you, you can then start doing stuff. Well, if you're, if you're using a Windows computer, you then need a, a piece of software to, to, to do that. And yeah. um, the, the one I like is, is Putty. Um, Windows used to come with quite a nice... Um, a terminal program called Hyper Terminal, but they ditched that yeah. back in XP days, and so and so the one to use now is is, is Putty, which is is really very good. It's um it's uh, it, it doesn't just do RS two three two um terminal sessions. It'll do uh, Telnet and and lots of other command line type protocols. So it's a good one to have on your PC. But Putty, you just say well you, I'm using this serial port, and 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 here are my here are my all my other parameters. And we should probably talk about parameters now because because that's all, also important. Mm -hmm. And unlike you know networks where we're very used to just jacking in a network cable one end, jack it into the switch at the other end, and it all magically works. You know all the kind of speeds and all that kind of stuff are sorted out for us. With RS two three two C, we have to tell the computer what data rate we're working at, um, and some various other arcane issues like how many uh, how many data bits there are in each in each um, um, word, uh, whether we're using parity. Um, stop and, and 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 start bits and flow control and things like that, um, but generally speaking, so for example, I've got I've got a page from the manual of a um, piece of equipment I was working on a couple of weeks ago. It's an Avacent uh, KVM sender, so the kind of thing that okay. you use to, to to send server um, um, terminal um, you know, GUI, uh, you know, across the internet or across a network, so you can control it elsewhere, kind of like a hardware VNC, if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, and and to control and, and, to, and to take remote control of one of their um, uh, boxes, you, you first of all want, you, you have to make sure you've got the correct cable. You've got the you've got a piece of software on your machine that you can use to talk uh, to the serial port RS two three two terminal. So I recommend Putty; it's very good. Uh, and then and then you have to make sure that you've set the port details um, uh, within Microsoft Windows or or, or whatever your um, operating system of choice is. To be the correct values, and I've just got the uh, the, um, the, the 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 window you get up when you go to the Windows Device Manager and and open up your serial port settings, uh, and uh, and and they're the things you've got to pay attention to: the bits per second, the number of data bits, whether you're using parity, stop bits, and flow control. Now, flow control is an interesting one, and uh, we should I should spend a bit more time talking about that, because back in the day, when it was all flow control via um, 
via 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 pins on an RS on on a, on a twenty five pin D connector. Um, so let me just find that that picture again. Um, so there we go. Let's pop that up so we can see that in more detail. Um, you'll see there are there are several um, uh, control uh, pins which aren't data related. There's um, uh, clear to send, request to send, data set ready, uh, data carry detect. Um, lots of lots of pins that are doing things like saying yes, the modem's up and running and it's got a dial tone. That's the ring indicator. Yes, the modem's established connection with the remote server with, with the remote machine. It's not particularly a server, um, and uh, uh, I'm asserting the request to send line because I want to start sending data. Is you know is the modem ready to start taking data? Um, uh, data set ready is the line that the modem um, takes high, coming back to you to say yes, the data set is ready. You can start sending data. Um, and these are all just highs and lows. They're, they're all they're, just logic they're, they're highs, highs and lows, which control yeah. the flow of data. And there'll be there'll be uh, you know TTL buffers at each end of this of this little serial line where data is being. It is all TTL, is it? It's all, is that yeah, it is. I mean, RS two three two on on the wire is is um, is between twelve and uh, twenty four volts because uh, it's meant okay. to be sent down a phone line. Um, you know, and you need kind of big swings to, to to make things work nicely. However, you know, the other side of the buffer chips, uh, you know, the logic on the boards, or rather, I should, I should say, the other side of the UARTs, uh, UART yeah. Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. It's the chip that that essentially interfaces TTR logic to an RS two three two line. So that's the thing that gets all the levels right and buffers it and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but 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 you know feeding RS two three two off the motherboard will be TTR logic and 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 it's looking for you know data lines being taken high and low to say yes data is ready to be sent data's you know no hold off now the buffer in the modem is full we've got to clear this data first and very very much you can see it's being done at the level of stuff being buffered in and out of of kind of eight byte chips you know which which will probably transistor yeah. logic um, back in the sixties. Um, so, so, so you can see there's an awful lot of history there, um, um, yeah. And and so that that really has little bearing on how we use RS two three two C today, because a lot of applications just ignore those handshaking lines. Now they just say, well, you know, we can everything runs a damn sight faster than than the 110 kiloboards that this that this protocol maxes out at. You know, uh, but you still have to have some flow control, as it's called. And so typically most things nowadays use what they call software flow control, or X on X off. Um, and they're just two ASCII characters that are reserved um, for that purpose. Control S and Control Q, or in in, right. in decimal terms, decimal nineteen for X off pause transmission, decimal seventeen for X on resume transmission, and uh, okay. and, that, and, they, and, that, and, that, and that at the software layer very much serves the function of what hardware flow control used to be. And so I've just just brought up the Windows dialog again. Um, which yeah. which there's a little drop down. It says flow control. The default is non, no flow control, uh, but you can select X on X off or hardware flow control. And again, there, that's in the that's in the settings dialog where you would be setting up an RS two three two port to start your session, your putty session, talking to this remote piece of equipment that you want to configure because it it talks RS two three two. So, um, with that in mind, uh, we can talk, start talking a little more a little bit more about null modem cables. So. Uh, you can build several kinds of null modem cables, um, uh, uh, and I've got a sort of slightly hand-drawn um, diagram up at the moment, which shows the difference between a three-wire null modem and a six-wire null modem. So it's obviously very handy sometimes to just be able to do it down a piece of audio cable. You might have an audio yeah. tie line between two areas, and that's perfect for sending RS232, because you really only need two conductors for the transmit-receive and an earth for the, for the return, for the ground. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you should really do the right thing uh, and and um, uh, wire the handshaking pins so that hardware handshaking, if it's been selected at either end, doesn't get in the way. So typically, people will short at each end the request to send and the clear to send pins together. So so right. when when the um, modem says um, so when the, when 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 the PC says sorry when the sending piece of equipment oh, I keep saying PC and when the sending piece of equipment um, asserts the request to send line um, the clear to send line essentially is shorted to that and and it's all good the, you know so basically you're wedging the door open exactly yeah um, and similarly the data set ready the data carry detect and the data terminal ready which says the modem's ready the uh, DTE, the PC or the or, or the terminals ready, 
and we've detected carrier on the line, they're all shorted together as well, so that that just, yeah. just doesn't get in the way. You do that at both ends of the cable, and 99 times out of 100, you're good. There are occasions when um, maybe the hardware flow control is implemented a bit more like the standard, uh, where you need a six-wire null modem cable, and that's on the, on the right-hand side of this diagram, where, again, the TX and the RX cross over, because it's a null modem cable, uh, but in this case, we cross over the RTS and the CTS and the CTS and the RTS, the request to send and the clear to send. And similarly, with the data set ready and the data terminal ready, we cross over those, shorting the data carry detect to the data set ready. Um, so yeah. in, in essence, we're saying there's a carrier on the line and the modem's ready. We shorted those two together. And yeah. we're crossing those over to the data terminal ready pin at the other end of the link. Um, so that's a, that's a sort of a full fat um, uh, null modem cable, and 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 the three wire is the kind of the lead-free, you know, the 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 uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the sugar-free mode uh, null modem cable. Um, yeah. uh, but to be honest, um, once you've selected hardware flow control, every contemporary piece of equipment supports hardware flow control, and and you'll be good. Um, so that's that's really that's all the mystery about null modems. And you know, I've I've. I, uh, wherever I've worked, I've always found myself, particularly working for a technical support provider, I've always found myself as the go-to guy to make a null modem cable. And, and barely a week goes by where somebody in tech support doesn't phone me up and says, oh, I've got to go to XYZ facility and configure their disk array or their, 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 their network switch or something like their fiber channel switch. I need an RS-232 null modem cable. Can you make me one? And I, and I must knock out you know, a couple of months, you know, because oh, really? and people just lose them, you know, or or they leave them places. I, I I bet there's there's a dozen of my null modem cables hanging off the back of network enclosures in various facilities around London. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it, you know, once you kind of know about why you need an null modem cable and how you make it, it's kind of brutally honest, brutally obvious. You know, it's not not hard at all. I spent many hours without the benefit of knowledge, um, struggling with trying to get things to talk to each other through RS two three two. Uh, in the past it's not something i have to worry about much these days but uh, i wish i'd known that um that historical fact without messrs wiki and and google uh, one, well, one struggled rather when i when i joined the bbc uh it was one of the uh, it, i don't think it wasn't at the evesham training center where, where where i spent probably a solid year of my first three years at the bbc it was it was a one day course that all engineers in television news had to go on RS two three two C. Everybody had to go on the one day course, and, and and somebody would kind of explain all this to you. I'll put up a slightly slightly neater version of the uh, of the pinout diagram for nine pin D cables. Um, the pinout varies between nine pin D and twenty five pin, as you'd expect. But if you're yeah. if you're making the most common kind type of null modem cables, I mean everything nowadays is nine pin. Um, mm -hmm. The two the two pinouts I've got up on screen at the moment suffice uh, entirely. Um, and uh, I've just again popped up that page from the Avocent manual, um, which uh, says what Avocent would expect if you were configuring uh, a hyperterminal session or or a putty session to talk to their box. Fifty seven six hundred board bits per second, uh, eight data bits, no parity, one stop bit, and no flow control. So their their box doesn't expect any flow control, um, and so consequently, whether you had null modem cable with the flow control pins wired or not, it wouldn't matter. Um, okay. And so that, that that kind of covers every base there. Um, uh, the because the thing that everybody's probably thinking of now is, hang on, I've got a Mac laptop, or hang on, I've got a, a PC laptop from the last ten years that doesn't have an RS two three two port on it. And that's very true. I, I, I'm exactly the same. I, I, I tend to use a, a MacBook Pro most of the time. I'm looking at you through one of those just now. Yes. Yeah. And 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 you think, well, how on earth, you know, if, if I'm if I've got to go, got to go, and, go and do some tech support in a facility and and, and talk to a piece of equipment over two three two, how am I going to do that? And uh, these things. Um, USB RS-232 converters, they are your friend. You should always have one of those in your rucksack. In fact, go back to our, our podcast on what's in your rucksack <laughs> what's and in Phil's rucksack, up, yes. update it with that because that's, uh, that, that's an important thing. Um, uh, and, uh, and once you've got that, uh, so if I go back to my page that showed my um, port settings, I think it will show us that. No, it doesn't. I should have captured more of the Windows dialog box because you'll notice that that's that's um, COM six. So when when PCs Perhaps came, you can fix that in post. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, when when PCs came with um, uh, RS two three two ports on the motherboard, they were invariably COM one and COM two, um, uh, uh, and and for some strange reason now, when you plug in a USB to uh, RS two three two adapter. Um, 
you know, Windows installs, um, you know, a little, little driver, which invariably it has itself already in its driver database. But sometimes you, you'll have to put in the disk that came with the, the gadget you bought in Maplins. Um, uh, but invariably it assigns it to COM6 or COM5. And this little one I've got, which, who, who, who makes this? Some, some unknown Taiwanese brand? This is a Lindy one, but probably made in China, you know. Um, mm -hmm. It varies. Sometimes I plug it in and it shows up as COM5. Sometimes I plug it in, it shows up as COM6. You know, and you have to go into the Windows Device Manager and have a look. But since you've got to go in there anyway to, um, to uh, uh, you know, do all the settings for whatever piece of equipment you're talking to today, um, uh, you, you know, you, you were going to have to look in there anyway. And, and, yeah, and, so, and so you'd have to tell Putty, you have to tell Putty what, um, what port it's talking to because by default... It will expect COM1. It will expect an old school PC with a blinking COM board on the motherboard. So, so in the main putty menu, you have to tell it, no, we're, we're, we're COM6 delay, please. Um, but once you've done all that, um, and you've got your cable, and uh, you've got your settings, you can start. You can start talking RS232. And uh, I've got up at the moment that uh, a, a, um, a session from um, that Avacent piece of equipment I was telling you about. Um, oh, yes. and, and it is really just old school you know numbers and and two letter commands to configure this piece of equipment so obviously if you find yourself in a situation where you're having to set up something like that yeah a familiarity with the manual you know will go a long way it's not these things you know there's no gui it's 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 um it's not point and click um you know there's no kind of f1 to access the help function it's uh, the kind of thing you just kind of have to pay attention to um so with all that in mind, I've just yeah. I've just got a couple of um, pictures up of null modem adapters. If you don't if you don't have uh, you know soldering iron to hand and the wherewithal, um, you can buy uh, ready-made null modem adapters that just just do that crossover for you, and uh, and typically you know keep that in your in, in your rucksack or whatever with all your other IT bits and 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 connect that to the piece of equipment and then connect your. Straight you used pin. to be able to get RS two three two couplers which had a, a series of switches, so you could. Yes, your own. that's exactly right. You could you could you could disable the the, 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 the handshaking lines and stuff like that. I haven't seen those for ages. So what I have got up on screen is the little LED mini testers you used to be able to get for RS two. Oh, yes, yes, you yes. can still get them. I, I keep one in my, my toolbox. I haven't used it for many a long year. And and those LEDs are across the various pins. And you see the one I've got right. up here. You can see you can see the. Um, the, 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 the TX and the RX pins at the top there, and it's got uh, request to send, a clear to send, data set ready and data terminal ready, and carry detect exposed as LEDs. So if you were diagnosing a, a, a fault with a with a with a um, a misbehaving um, RS232 line, um, just just sticking that in circuit um, would uh, would allow you to see kind of what was going on on the various lines. And I mean the thing about RS232 when it was when it was first commonly used. The standard was 110 board, 110 bits per second, you know, and you don't have to be a very fast touch typist to type faster than that, you know. You know, even no. even back then, data operators um, could could outperform the speed of the of the of the modem connection back to the mainframe, um, and so you know you could you could see kind of LEDs winking, you know, on your little tester letter, and, this, and, and, this. and understand what was going on, um, uh, but. Um, you know, RS two three two obviously, you know, it's been pushed a lot further than it was ever intended to. You know, uh, and and um, when it was just used to connect to modems, you know, obviously the fastest modems, even you know, even right up into the late nineties when we were still using dial up modems, um, they kind of maxed out at what fifty fifty six hundred boards, fifty six hundred k is yeah, something yeah, like right, that. That's yeah, that's um, so so so, so even then, uh, not much was expected of RS two three two. But but I think you know most equipment. Um, tops out at 115 kiloboard, so even right. even you know, but, but I mean, hey, that's a snail's pace compared to Ethernet, isn't it? And compared to all the other fast protocols we have nowadays. So that's RS232C. Um, uh, just a little shorty, little half hour explanation there. I'm not, I'm not sure if there's anything else I can tell you about it. Um, no, I, I think just just to remind ourselves that you know, 50 years doesn't you shouldn't uh, despise things just because they're old. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's there's, there's there's you'll still find these little things dotted around the place. Well, and, I, I, uh, I a think, little history goes a long way. More than just elderly equipment, it, it is still used on on current model equipment, and, yeah. and yeah. that's because it's just so easy to implement. And 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 if you know a piece of equipment just needs some configuration data entering into it, and it you know they don't want to have to implement an operating system with an IP stack and 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 all that kind of stuff. Two three two C, you know the. It's all implemented in a UART chip, and and uh, and, and very quickly. I imagine a manufacturer very cheaply can be can be um, 
you know, providing um, you know configuration with, 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 without any expense or, or uh, licensing of software or anything like that. Yeah, indeed. And you were saying that uh, on your Raspberry Pi, which you haven't had a, a chance to play with yet, that it talks RS-232 as well. Uh, the Raspberry Pi does have an RS-232 port, although it doesn't have it at RS-232 levels. It's, it's TTL. Um, the, the, the gadget, um, which I do have to use oh, our right. proper RS-232 to talk to, is, is the Netium boards, um, which um, you know we'll be talking about in the next yeah. podcast. Uh, you can figure them entirely through 232. Super. And um, and so we'll we'll talk, we'll talk about that a bit more then. And just a, a, a little kind of thing there because I obviously had to make up a, a, a null modem cable because somebody in support had nicked the last one. Um, uh, <laughs> the, the the nice little thing I did with that was those boards um, to put them into configuration mode. You have to short a, a jumper on them. So when I built the board into a box, I took that little jumper back onto the twenty five pin connector on the back of the box, and in my little you know Netium programming cable, which really was just a, a null modem cable. I shorted the pins on the other side of the connector. So when I plugged the cable in to start doing configuration, it put the board into configuration mode. When I unplugged oh, it, configuration done, the board goes back into its normal mode. So, uh, so that was kind of a nice, a nice little trick to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to make sure it's all, it was always in the correct mode. Intelligent cable. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> As it were. Well, that's been fantastic, Phil. Thank you very much indeed. And anybody who's watching any of these, if you have a question, uh, please send it to either hugh at hjwaters.co.uk or, or to Phil there, at, uh, and you'll put a, whichever address you want. I will, yeah. Phil, yeah. At, Phil at threeboys.co.uk. Phil at threeboys. Yeah. Um, and I know that we have people around the globe seeing these funny little things. Um, so it'd be great to get some feedback. And... It, any idea of topics that you'd like us to cover? Uh, one thing that sprung to mind, of course, is um, RS-422, which we won't talk about today, but uh, I, has it, is, it, is it related? Absolutely. Well, let's, let's just give it a little two minutes. RS-422 is okay, entirely related. And if I can just bend down here and grab... Uh, there we go. Um, one of these That's little things, the sound effects. which which anybody who's done any work, you know, doing technical support for Avid will know, is, is a Rosetta Stone adapter. Um and, and, and that is an RS-232 to RS-422 adapter. And it's nothing more than a, uh, a line driver with, with balancing built in. So RS-422 is entirely similar to RS-232. And that's why all the original model AVIDs, you know, um, always came with a, a 232 to 422 adapter for connecting to a VTR. And that would connect to the COM1 port on the back of the PC. And, and the, the, the Rosetta Stone, um, literally uh, on, on one side, it's got a connection to the PC, and the other side is VTR. Uh, and obviously, it's a female to female because it's a DCE. It's a data communicating yeah. equipment, and they've done it correctly. They've, they've, they've put the right sex of connector on there, and you just need a straight pin-to-pin, um, male-to-female cable to connect the Rosetta Stone to the back of the PC. The PC sees it just as a 232 serial port, uh, and it doesn't yeah. even know that, that, um, that the Rosetta Stone um, is, is then balancing up the TX and RX lines, and uh, and dispensing with all the handshaking lines because 422 doesn't doesn't use that for for, for flow control, and uh, and then Avid or you know, whatever software you're using to control the VTR, it goes in and behind the scenes it sets the port settings correct for 422, which is uh, um, a 38 500 board for for, for, yeah. for for the for the data rate, and uh, and off you go and uh, and you're you, you know the, the 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 Avid is then controlling um, the RS 422. Uh, VTR down a two three two port, not even knowing that, that there's this nice little piece of uh, of tomfoolery in the way, which is which is converting <laughs> between two three two and four two two for us. So two three two four two two four four two two is just an industrialized, ruggedized, balanced, goes a lot further, a lot better defined version of two three two. There we are, and there another mystery falls away. <laughs> like veils on the, on the dancer. We'll we'll stop there. I think <laughs> jolly good. Okay, but thank you very much indeed, Phil. And until the next time. Until the next time, which which will be Raspberry Pi. I will have spent some time. I will have got to know the thing, and um, and we'll be all good. I'll see you soon, Hugh. Well, uh, nothing nothing like a little bit of fruit for winter. There we are. <laughs>